Matthew 22, verse 34. And it goes as follows. But when the Pharisees heard that he had, so he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for an opportunity just to be able to share your word with your people. I pray, O oh Lord, that the, the word will not fall on deaf ears, but will edify every single person here present, myself included, O oh God. Father, I pray that your word comes alive in our, in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our being. It, it brings us peace. It brings us clarity. It brings us provision and it brings us a greater understanding of your love for us. Continue to bless those that are here. Bless those that are tuning online. And may we continue to honour you and reverence you in truth and in spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 I'm going to tell you a brief story about this. I'm always looking at Matthew chapter 22 and it says, You need to love um, the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. I will never forget when I first got saved. And I was reading this, I'm like, this is impossible. I was reading it, I was like, like, all right, you know what, let me just try it. I don't know if you guys have ever, when you first got saved, you're mad excited. Anyone ever been there? Where you're just excited, you're like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And I was trying to love God with all my heart, all my soul, my mind, with all of my being. And I found it so challenging, both in and out of season, to the point I'm like, how do we, how would we do this? And I'm so grateful, <laughs> so early on in my walk with Christ, that the Holy Spirit convicted me saying, this is why Jesus did it for you. This is why we needed the, the, the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. This is why we understand that Jesus was perfect in all that he did. And that brought me peace. I was like, wow. But at the same time, that made me take my foot off the gas slightly. I took my foot off the gas thinking, oh, what, Jesus is doing it. I don't really need to do it. And then upon not even trying to attempt it, you realize that your eyes go from looking and reading in his word to beginning to look at the world. And like, oh, what's the world doing? How's the world doing? And you totally forget and you lose yourself completely. But why do I share this with you? Because it says the lawyer, it says one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. It's interesting how the scripture emphasized that it was a lawyer. The people that make sure that they understand the blueprint. The people that make sure that if one of your words may be incorrect, they can penalize you for that. Or either the contract or the agreement is now null and void. The lawyer asked him a question. Saying, teacher, which is the greatest of the commandments in the law? And Jesus says to love your God. Love. Love. This interesting thing called love. The month of February where everyone wants to celebrate love. Or if you're maybe... Nigerian that wants to be American, you say love. Oh, my wonderful people from other nations, they say love. It's depending on what part of the world you are from, there is this universal thing that we all want in one way, shape or form in our lives called love. 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 Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And at times we believe this thing called love is a feeling. I got a feeling. Someone's already singing the rest of the song. <laughs> and in this thing called love, being, being a feeling, I was thinking of the sermon. I was like, wow, this brought me stories. I was like, should I leave them unnamed or name them? I said, no, nah, let me name these ladies. My wonderful period in life in primary school. A wonderful lady, sister, friend of mine called Dominique. If she's online or she knows where I lived, or only Dominique was just like, wasn't even childhood sweethearts, was primary school sweethearts. So it's null and void now. But then I'll never forget Dominique. Wonderful girl, she was a surfer. And anyone that knows what I mean by she was a surfer, it means that her hair, the waves in her hair was really waving. 
wonderful young lady I'll never forget in primary school when we're going to the museums and they say pair up in twos I'm rushing to find Dominic Dominic come and I'll never forget me and my wonderful African hands and her soft hand it was just an, a, an amazing moment just to hold her hand and you know those times where sometimes someone needs to go to the toilet or they need to go and grab a sweet or they need to get something from their back you don't want to let go of their hand but they need that hand you're like oh sorry it's let me leave you to do what you need to do. Then grab a hand again. Stay in twos, guys. Nowadays, I've seen them when they go to the children and they go to like the museums or whatever. They have to wear these aprons, right? But then we don't have no aprons. But is it aprons? What do you call it? High fives. All right, you know what? Keep it, keep it to yourself, man. I'll, I'll call it an a luminous apron. And um, we didn't have those then, so we had to make sure our hands were tight. And I used to tell her like, make sure you hold on to my hand. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was doing the most. I probably loved her with all of my mind, all of my heart, and all of my soul. Probably you was really thinking about it, and the Holy Spirit was reminding me that you thought you was in love. You were just infatuated. You were just a baby. You thought all the little tingles and everything you was feeling in your Nigerian belly was making you feel that this is life. But it wasn't. There was more to life than that experience. But why do I share this with you? Because I'll never forget another young lady in my teenage years now. I'm no longer six to eight. So, Dominique, we've moved on from that and we realized that I see one chocolate mama Sita. I was about 12, between 12 and 14. Her name was Rochelle. I haven't seen her in 15 years. Rochelle, if you ever listen to this online, may the Lord be with you. I'm a pastor now. <laughs> Praise God. But I shared a story about Rochelle because I'll never forget when I was doing the most. Like, yeah, when Rochelle wanted to go to library, guess what? Me too, I wanted to go library. When Rochelle wanted to go to the park, me too, I wanted to go to the park. When Rochelle wanted to go out to party, me too. No, I couldn't go party. My mom don't play them games. <laughs> I have to stay in the house. I have to stay in the house. But I share this with you because I will never forget when I was trying to be really good friends with Rochelle. I didn't know that the, the R&B artist Mario was a prophet. I didn't know that Rochelle only saw me as just a friend. But when I realized that I was merely just a friend to her, it limited the capacity of what I wanted to extend our friendship to go and grow into. You see, I share this with you because the title of my sermon is What Does Love, sorry, What Love Looks Like. The title of my sermon is What Love Looks Like. And this is part one. And part one, the subtitle for that is Wholeness. 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 You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. You need to. But, what, but why, what does it mean to love your God with all your soul, all your heart, and all your mind? There are many things that we can go into because for us, we think love is one thing, but we realize that there are various types of love. We see love in the Hebrew where ahava, or in the Aramaic where it's rachma, or in the Greek as we like to call it agape. Or when people talk about the four different loves in being storge, the empathy, the bond, the one that we may have with family, a purposeful love, a deep one that is deep rooted within us, or philia for the, the bond that we may have with friends. We live in an age where sometimes myself and my fellow brothers, brother, when I grow up, what do we like? You look nice, bro. What does he say? No, I'm trying to be like, you, bro. The new age version of filial, where we're just trying to reciprocate that love that we have for our, our fellow friend and, or, or the love, the eros, the Valentine's Day love. Valentine's is coming. Don't you dare make that a worship song. Don't you dare make that a worship song. Well, as I, or the last one, as I mentioned earlier, agape, the unconditional bond, the love that God has for us, the love that even when we think we fully mastered it, we've only at the beginning. Even when we think we've come to understand what God's love really does feel like within us, we're still only scratching the surface. But in understanding these four loves, I want us to understand that if I was to give you a few pointers of what I believe love looks like, point number one is that without love, we are nothing. Without love, we are nothing. For those of you guys that are following in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it tells us in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become, sound, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbals. 
Though that I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and though, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I have nothing. I love this because this separates the performers to the world that truly worship the King of Kings. See, many people are good at performing and empty barrel truly makes the loudest noise. But when you're filled with substance, you don't need to show off about the love that you have. Because your disposition is not to be seen by the world, but to be found in a place of service. You have nothing. Verse 4, it tells us, it says, love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. (laughs) And it thinks no evil. Every time I read this, I'm like, (laughs) qualified? Ah, disqualified. Qualified? Yeah, I'm not there yet. And I'm seeing it over and over. And the more I begin to look at it, it doesn't even stop there. There's more. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love endures. In the microwave mindset of the society that we live in, people forget that love endures. I believe the birth of council culture is more or less alive because people forget that to love is to also endure. Not to hold on to the pain of the past or the judgment of people, but to really hold on to knowing that, you know what, because you've chosen to repent and change your ways, you too are made in the image of God who also loves you. But the culture in which we live in, we choose to position ourselves as the judge, point fingers, forgetting that every finger we point, another three is pointing back at us. Please let us people, let us be people that take the, 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 the plank out of our own eye before we take the speck out of everybody else's. Because love truly never fails, as it tells us in verse 8. But there's something interesting here about this. It tells us in verse 8, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether it's where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Verse 9, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. What am I trying to say here? What do I believe? The scripture is speaking to us. What is perfect? is to be in the perfect presence of the true and living king. It's wholeness. It's fullness. It's being in the presence of when you know God fully. The things that people do to you are like paper mache. They don't amount to anything. I truly believe the importance of understanding wholeness and being whole in God and being filled with who God is, is that we can truly live out what we're seeing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We can truly be people that understand that love does suffer long, yet it remains kind. That love doesn't envy because envy poisons the very essence of the love of Christ that lives within you. When you understand that the love of God that lives within you, it doesn't parade itself because it's constantly thinking of other people apart from one self. Unfortunately, the times that we have lived in or we do live in, has now began to celebrate what people call as self-love, but at times might be deemed as selfishness. If people do this to me, cut them off. Nobody above blocking. We live in a culture and a society at times where people have now said, you know what, as soon as you do this, mm -mm, it's over. And you know what, other people in and around the world or online or those that, 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 that believe in the same way that we believe in those things that, yeah, I'm with you on that, yeah. And if there's one thing I began to see, I'll never forget going to, uh, uh, it was a gathering. And there was my brothers and sisters in the faith there. And as some of the many topics come up, the topic of relationships came up. And some of the ladies there were having conversations of what they were tolerate and what they wouldn't tolerate in a marriage. And as the conversations were happening, I began to look around the room at the married women. They were quiet. They didn't say much. And I asked them privately after the event, why did you not say much? They're like some of the ladies that were sharing weren't ready to understand what true love looks like. Because if they knew, they'll realize it's, it's, it's less about what you have to say and more about what you have to do. 
They began to understand that love, as we've seen late in the latter verse of Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 to 11, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just also I am known. Verse 13 goes as follows. Now abide in faith, hope and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Why is the greatest of these love? Because in heaven, you probably don't need faith anymore. There's nothing to hope for because you're in the full presence of the very thing you hoped for. But because God is love, you're always in the presence of God's love. Love. What does love look like? What does love look like? Point number two, where you abide becomes your abode. Where you abide becomes your abode. In John, 1 John 4, verse 16, it says as follows, and we have known and believed that, um, the love that God has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Where are you abiding? Where is your mindset abiding? What are you feeling? Many of us, we think time is a healer, but time without activity might not be a healer at all. You just probably put things out of mind, but it's not out of time. And as soon as a crisis or the object of the very thing we've been avoiding props up and we see it, the very feeling of the pain or the hurt or the bitterness or the brokenness comes to the forefront. Why? Because as I've said many times before, whatever one fails to address will soon find its way to our new home address. We must choose to find wholeness before maybe we find the love of a loved one, a romantic love or a love of a family. We need to truly find wholeness in God because when we are made whole, guess what? When we see the very thing that might have brought brokenness to us, we don't feel pain or bitterness. But we pray that the beauty of Christ will be bestowed upon such a person because we realize that maybe they did it from a place of emptiness or their brokenness. And we want to see the love of Christ really infused within the cracks of their hearts, of their minds, and of their lives. What does love look like? What does love look like? Point number three, love is a choice and an act of the will. Love is a choice and an act of the will. What do I mean by that? In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, it goes as follows, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Love is a choice and an act of the will. A choice. No, it's not a choice. It's a feeling. Feeling? Yeah, man, it's a feeling. No, I feel it. Oh, you feel it? Yeah. All the songs, media, music and movies. It's just a feeling from what you see on Netflix to what you're hearing online. It's a feeling. To stimulate the eros, the feeling. And then you have conversations with people that have been in that feeling in relationships. Hey man, when do you guys get together? How's it going? Yeah man, I'm falling in love. I'm falling in love. <laughs> falling in love. <laughs> See them a couple months, a couple years later. What happened? What's, what's popping in the relationship? Oh, we fell out of love. We fell out. Oh, so you fall in, you fell out. So gravity is controlling your relationship. Yeah. <laughs> All this time. The feeling. But Jesus heightens it. An act of the will. No real desire. The fear of going to the cross. That he sweated tears like blood. An act of the will. Not my will but yours. I truly come to believe. As many other scholars have come to say. That biblical love is an act of the will. Not led by emotion. But accompanied by it. So I'm not going to discard the emotion altogether. Because God also feels. God also grieves, but God still loves. An act of the will. How many of you guys have brothers and sisters here? How many of you guys love your brothers and sisters? Watch this. How many of you guys like your brothers and sisters? <laughs> some of you guys will stay. Some hands were like this, yeah. Because sometimes to like is the feeling, but to love is the choice. Because you can't always choose your family, but you could choose your friends. But even though they are family, you know what? I need to go past the feeling in order to make sure that I wish for their well-being. Love truly is an act of the will. And it's also a choice. Point four, love is sacrificial. I'll say it again. Love is sacrificial. 
No, I think I'll say it again for those that are still believing in the, in the sermon of, or the doctrine of soft life. Love is sacrificial. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 26, it tells us something quite significant. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. I'll pause there for a moment. Love your wives the way Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. I'll never forget when I had to sit down with um, a, a couple and um, we, we did it together and then um, through the other meetings, I would sit down with the wife and I sit down with the husband and I, I remember sitting down with the husband and he came to me and he was sharing like, now nah, Emmanuel, man, when my wife does this, that and the other, I'll never forget one time um, she, she wanted me, she, she shared something with me and I was like, yeah, that's cool. She said, no, man, I want you to really embrace it. And he was confused. He was like, bruv, like, I just said it's all right. Like, why is it, why did she want more than just that? I was like, my dear brother, my dear brother. <laughs> Men and women are not the same. And I think until we truly acknowledge that we are fully not the same, but also understand that to love your wife means you need to position yourself, posture yourself, and perform in a way that the way she receives love makes her feel acknowledged, makes her feel seen, makes her feel felt, makes her feel protected, makes her feel covered, makes her feel cultivated. Because when you're willing to understand that love is sacrificial, it's not about necessarily how you see it, but maybe how she might feel it, how she needs it. The truth is also true for the guys. It's not always sports. Sometimes us too, we want to be told, how are you today? I believe in you. Because sometimes we are at war with ourselves. That even when we act like we believe in ourselves, an external voice might be a form of respect that allows us to remember that we also need to respect the God within us that wants us to move forward within ourselves. Verse 26 in Ephesians 5 goes as follows. That we might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. With the washing of water by the word. With the washing of water, not by dove soap. Not by black soap or dudu osun, as my mom would say. But by the word. The word. See, there's something that when you go back and you look at the word, you might realize in that moment in time that I haven't even positioned myself in line with the word. And therefore, you grabbing the word to wash your woman with is also a reminder to you that you might need to wash yourself with it as well. Because to wash somebody with dirty hands still leaves the person dirty. But when you wash somebody with the word, you must first position yourself to go to the word, be positioned to receive the word so that you can give the word. Love is sacrificial. John 15 verse 13 to 16 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. To lay down one's life for his friends. For you, my friends, if you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you my servants, for a servant doesn't know but what the master is doing, but I have called you my friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. A very important part in verse 16. You do not choose me, but I chose you. And I appoint to you that you should go and bear fruit. I love this. You should go and bear fruit. Why, is, why do I love this? Because it says you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain. You bear fruit, but your fruit would remain. I love you. You abide in me and I in you, but I have chosen you. And I want you to bear fruit. More fruit, but as you bear more fruit, your fruit remains. Wholeness. Wholeness. Many of us have, at times, we might have seeked relationships from empty places. So the moment the person goes, so does the love. And we're back to a place of feeling empty. My other half, it doesn't exist if you're a Christian. She's my better half, it doesn't exist if you're a believer in Christ. Single or married, you are made whole in Christ. My other whole, my companion, my partner in purpose, yes. My other half, so if they pass, you're only half alive. 
No. You are made whole in Christ. You are made whole in Christ. And when you are made whole and you know that you can bear fruit <laughs> and God has chosen you to bear more fruit so that your fruit remains, your fruit remains because you are made whole. Wholeness. What does love look like? There's a quote I used to say that anything you cannot give away is ever truly yours. Anything you cannot give away is ever truly yours. At times we withhold and at times we need to withhold out of wisdom and having the correct boundaries in place. But there are times we withhold because we're scared. We withhold because we're scared that if I give that to you, I leave myself with nothing. Please understand that Jesus died for us. All of him. But the one that he lays his life down could also what? Take it up. And if you cannot give away, is it ever truly yours? What do we do with the children in our church? We rededicate them back to the Lord. And as I've said, your children are not yours. They're God's given to you to steward. And as you rededicate them back to God, you're saying, God, what you've blessed me with and what you've given to me, I give back to you. And I pray and I'll do everything within my being to be a good steward, to nurture them and teach them in the ways of the Lord. See, love is sacrifice. Another point. Love also means you need to learn to love your enemies. You need to learn to love your enemies. Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 43 some parts of it tell us this. But you have heard that it is said you should love your neighbour and hate your enemies. Old Testament. Verse 44. But I say to you to love your enemies. Here's where it gets really deep. It says I, I want you, I say to you to love your enemies. It doesn't stop there. Bless those who curse you. It doesn't stop there. Do good to those who hate you. It doesn't stop there. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Right there and then I already see cancel culture being cancelled. Because the idea of cancel culture is that I cancel you so that you can't do anything else to me. Completely. But Harris told us that no, 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 no. no. Pray for those who spitefully use who? You. It didn't say us. It made it personal. You. When was the last time you prayed for the person that spitefully used you? What is it? No, you intentionally pray for them. Not that like God removed them from my mind. Yeah. You could use the blocking instrument on social media out of two ways. Security and insecurity. The problem is that at times people have used that out of insecurity thinking they've made themselves secure up until that person pops up in real life. How are you dealing with your so-called enemies? How are you navigating around this, this thing called pain or problems or bitterness or brokenness or debt. For some, we've probably seen the recent documentary, the, the, the um, Tinder Swindler. I was going to leave it unnamed, but I've put it out there. I just found it interesting how the guy said, the guy called Simon said, Peter is down. I was like, right, Simon, Peter, scripture. Don't worry, that's a whole revelation. So only some of you guys got that. But as I began to look at it, I began to see it more and more. He said, my enemies are after me. <laughs> send money. I say this, your enemies that have been after you, send them a prayer. Your enemies that are after you, send them a blessing. Your enemies that are after you, continue to do good to them. Your enemies that are after you, make sure you pray for them. Because guess what's worse than you blocking your enemies? Them being blocked away from the eternal presence of a loving God. And I wish that none of our enemies ever have to be in such a place. Yes, I've grown up in a culture and an environment where even our parents at times know how to pray against their enemies. But like I've said before, even at the end of eternity, it's still the beginning of the eternity for your enemies. And I'd rather for them to repent and be restored and made whole by a true and loving God. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. To love is to be at service. To love is to be at service. Mark chapter 10 verse 43 goes as follows. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom. Sacrifice. 
Ransom, sacrifice for who? Many. Son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve. What love looks like. Not what does it say. How does it look? How does it perform? How does it behave? What does love look like? And that's why I truly believe why Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Service. There's times where we went out on an outreach and people are like, oh my days, I don't know what to say when we go on an outreach. I'm like, just come. Worst case, if you don't know what to say to the person, just ask them at the end, can I pray for you? I remember speaking to a person when after outreach, I'm like, how did you find it? Like, bro, it's like I received more than, than what I gave. Like, listening to people's stories, it humbled me. I said, yeah, this is what Jesus meant. This is love on display. This is love in action. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And that leads me to the next point. Because love forgives. Love forgives. Luke chapter 22, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why was Jesus able to say that? They mocked him. They spat on him. They crucified him. You're the king of the Jews. Save yourself. <laughs> ah, man, love. You go back to seeing what we read in 1 Corinthians. It says love. It, it, it's not puffed up. You would understand exactly why Jesus didn't react when they spoke like that. Many of us, we've been drawn out by people. Been drawn out. Oh, they triggered me. They drew me out. They can only draw you out when they can hook themselves to you. They can only draw you out where there is a hook of something you haven't healed from yet. You can't be drawn out where, you, where there's no hook. You can't be. You can't be. What do I mean by that? I'm saying that there are areas to our lives where we've been triggered because we haven't removed the ammo from the gun. What do, I, what do you mean, Emmanuel? You're triggered because the things that trigger you, maybe, not for all, but maybe, there might have been a moment where you need to remove the ammo from the gun. This is not good, it goes over there. This isn't good, it goes over there. So when people say things, rather than you thinking it's a reflection of you, because one is now whole, you can now see it's a reflection of where they currently are. And when you understand where someone currently is, rather than you being puffed up with anger or revenge, you feel a deep, a deep essence to really want to pray for such an individual. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They're not currently in their right mind. Give them the, the ability to be in their right mind. Verse 37 of Luke chapter 23, it says, saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And as I said again, Jews didn't react. I always deep it. If there's one thing I've come to learn and a quote I love, is that I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than a, a, a gardener at war. And Jesus truly was a warrior in the garden. From the garden of Gethsemane to the cross. He could have just thought it. All he had to do was think it. The legions of angels would have sorted everybody. I, do you, I think we, 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 unfortunately, the world to some degree sissified this, this Jesus. Just had to think it. That's how I know Jesus was a Nigerian. Because I'm sure he would have fought it. Because we're good at thinking things, but not doing that at times. <coughs> he would have fought it. Like, mm, you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was over him saying in, in, in Greek, Latin and Hebrew, then one of the criminals who hanged the blaspheme saying, if you are Christ, save yourself, save us. Draw it out, provoked. But when you are whole, you don't have to perform for people. When you are whole, you are not led or triggered by what people want to make you do so that you perform for them. When you are whole, you realize that not every relationship is the ship you're meant to be on because it might be sinking. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And then you find that very person cheats on you and now the whole world comes crashing down. And everything you're thinking is about everything I've done for you. But when you are whole, you realize that you do it more than just for them. You do it for God, but because you do it for God primary, God forgive them for they know not what they do. 
But now, allow me to set sail in the purpose that you have for me so I could be aligned with you. Love forgives. 1 Peter 4 verse 8 says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers a multitude of sin. I've come to realize that maybe marriage isn't hard. Maybe humans are hard. Maybe humans are hard. Maybe marriage is tough and challenging. But maybe humans make it hard. Maybe humans make it complex. Maybe us humans have the wrong depiction of what love really looks like. Because when I realized that what love really looks like, I'll never forget what one of my mentors shared with me on some of his good friends that were married for 50 odd years. And we sat and I listened to his story about their love life and how long they've been together and how they've been together for more than 50 years. And he watched them and I couldn't see them, but I looked at my mentor's eyes to see the story through his eyes, to see their love through his story and his belief of what they shared, to see what was being told about them through the lens that he looked through. And as I watched him, he said there's one thing that they mentioned to him when he asked them, what's kept your marriage going for so long? What's kept it? And you can imagine me being there, also growing up in a household where marriage or love has been broken and seeing it in some of my friends' and family's lives, let alone from what we've seen on the media and TV. But to really experience it and see it, i like, what, what, what's the secret? He asked them. One word. Amnesia. I was deflated, like, bruv. Really, the whole suspense, the climax. I'm ready to hear what this magic thing is that held their love together for all of 50 years. Amnesia. <laughs> you see, as soon as he said that, I remembered. What we see in 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. Amnesia. Love forgives. It thinks of the bigger picture because the enemy is always trying to borrow holes like a fox. And sometimes the things that break the relationship is not the big thing, but an accumulation of the small things. Over and over again. And that leads me to the few final things I wanted to share with you. Is that we live because God loves us. We live because God loves us. First John chapter 4, verse 7 to 21. First John chapter 4, verse 19 to be specific. It tells us we live because God loves us. In verse 18 it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love. Perfect, again. What I believe is synonymous with wholeness. Perfect love casts out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. Therefore, we should aim to be made perfect in love. Because when you're perfected by the love of God, you are whole. And when you are whole, you are full. And when you are full, you overflow. And when you overflow, you realize that when a candle lights another candle, the original candle never dims its light. Are we going to be made whole? Are we going to be made whole? I love what it tells me in in John chapter 15, verse 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy will remain in you and your joy may be full. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy will remain in you, not around you, in you, wholeness. And that your joy, my joy transferred into you to become your joy, and that your joy may be full, wholeness. Whatever you truly cannot give away is never truly yours. How come you you can laugh with people, you can always be joyful with people, because I can't exhaust the joy of Christ that is deposited in me. And the more I give it to people, guess what? God renews and gives me a new joy for a new day and a new season. Because yeah, weeping may endure for a night, but his joy comes in the morning. And if there's one thing I love God for, is that whether we've been rebellious or we've walked in righteousness, his joy still comes in the morning. His mercy is new every morning. The sun rises and your heart hasn't stopped beating even when you turn your heart against God. To love your God, with all your mind, body, soul, and strength. And I close with First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also 
Be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. He's instructed us. I love how it said be and not become. Be the state to embody, to embrace. Be holy for I am holy. Because when you understand what it means to be holy for I am holy, we realize that God wants us to be made whole in him. What does love look like? What does love look like? I'll leave you my final story. My story goes with a wonderful teacher in primary school called Miss Chang. I'll never forget this moment in my life where I was in the playground with two other females from another, the other class. You know, in primary school you have, I don't know if you guys had it, you had like the same year group, but two separate classes. So two young ladies from the other class were there and uh, they were playing and they were picking on me in the playground and I, and I said some violent things. I said, if you touch me again, I'm gonna punch your nose. And they'll run away, hee hee, giggling. But I never touched them and I never would, but I just wanted them to leave me alone so I can get on playing football. Lunchtime ended, back in class. My teacher, Miss Chang, another person I've been looking for on Instagram, uh, not Instagram, Facebook, I've actually DM'd her, say, hey, Miss Chang, listen, it's me, man, long time, I'm your student. She hasn't replied, don't worry, we'll still pray about that. <laughs> and the thing with Miss Chang, she's one of those teachers that I really adored. You know those teachers that you just get along with, that feels like family? So when you're like, everyone sit up straight. Well done, Emmanuel. <laughs> happy as happy always been the best for Miss Chang I never wanted to be on her bad side I never wanted to be on her bad side and those girls went to tell their teacher and say sir sir the guy Emmanuel in the other classroom he, he hit us in the playground anyone that knows me they know that if there's two things I do not tolerate or I struggle with I dare say struggle with I don't like lies and I don't like deception mm, me no 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 lies and deception no no do whatever you want but lies and deception oh no 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 so I came to the room across and he came to speak and he said, Miss Chang, I'm... and I saw, I looked at him, I saw the chick, I was like, what's going on here? You know, you're like, you can see the, the whole story unraveling in your life. I'm from Peckham. So this is really happening. I'm like, right, okay, what? Well, it's on. Lies, yeah, snitches. Liars and snitches. So it's, 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 it's double homicide. It's dangerous. And they went and Sir started saying how much I've hit them. And I was there and I remember sitting there and saying, like, Mr. Lion, Mr. Chang, wait, Emmanuel, let Sir finish. And then, the more Sir spoke and the more he spewed the lies of what they, they told him, I became more angry. Mr. Lion, the lion, shh, Emmanuel, wait. And I couldn't stomach it anymore to the point that I, Mr. Lion, and I started shouting. Have you ever shouted? They began to cry. Have you ever shouted? They began to cry and the hiccups start coming. <laughs> the, the lion, the lion. Said, Emmanuel, calm down, wait. I don't know what came over me. Mr. Lion, the lion, the lion. The table I was sitting on, I lifted up the table. Like WWF. And then they landed on somebody. I lifted up the table. The lion, Mr. the lion. Miss looked at me. Thank you, sir. That's enough. You can go back with them. And I don't know if you've ever been there where you think your tears and the genuineness of your heart makes everyone like, yeah, man, I feel your pain, bro. I can see that you're really telling the truth about this story. I feel you. And Miss looked at me. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you embarrass me in front of everybody? Emmanuel, control yourself. Control your emotions. I became small. I shrunk in my seat. I was embarrassed. And I went home thinking, the teacher who I love, I care for, and I always want to be the best. She's just thrown it back at me. That was one of the best experiences of my life. Because it also taught me that love is self-control. I needed to learn to control myself. But when you realize you can't control yourself, you need to go to the one that has everything under control. The living king that wants you to win from within. The one who truly wants to hold your hand through the pain. The one that is the true umbrella for you in the midst of the rain. The God that truly knows what love looks like and wants you to be whole again. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you've been in a place where sometimes love is hard, where it's tough to be vulnerable or you feel you've been heartbroken or at times you, you give enough love to keep your sanity and to be present but not enough love that it might lead you to a place of feeling empty. 
if you feel at times where, you know, I, I, I really want to be made whole again, I want to pray with you. I'm not going to tell you to stand or anything, but I would love everybody for that feel present. That, you know, God, I want to feel your love just to raise your hand so I can pray with you here today. If you feel at times that it's been challenging and difficult, but you're like, you know, God, yeah, it, it's tough. The pain is tough. Sometimes you feel unloved. You feel God's love, but you want more. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, Lord God, those that have their hands pointed towards heaven, oh God, Father, I pray that you fill them with the love of Christ. I pray that you fill them with your heavenly presence. I pray that you transform them from the inside out. I pray, oh God, that you make them new. You pour into them a fresh wine, a fresh water, a fresh anointing for them to be made whole, that they can look like you, oh God, for God is love. Teach us to mirror you, O God. Fill us with your peace. Fill us with your power. Teach us to be still and to remain by your living water that we may fully know you and fully make you known into a lost and lonely world. Father, I pray that the fire of the Holy Spirit will fill the bosom of every heart and every mind in this place that they'll be anointed and baptized by your love. For where faith ceases, prophecies cease, speaking in tongues cease, love remains. May your love remain in them and may they abide in you for the rest of their days. In Jesus' name. And as every head is still bowed,